Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Today we'll be going deep into the hot zone to find the ancient mystery of Atlantis in Bimini through the work of the late Dr. David Zink and an exclusive interview with his widow, Joan Zink, who helped not only with Dr. Zink's groundbreaking expeditions, but actually gave psychic readings to locate submerged structures in the Bahamas. The secret work in the hot zone between Bimini, Miami, Cuba, and the Yucatan Peninsula can now be revealed and involves a behind the scenes geopolitical chess game of finding the extensive ruins of an advanced ancient culture as land is starting to rise in the Atlantic. The psychic Edgar Cayce called this area Poseidia and predicted the temples of Atlantis would eventually rise there. He accurately foresaw the discovery of the Bimini Wall years before it was found in 1968. In his Poseidian expedition, Dr. Zink decided to use a psychic team to help him locate the ruins off Bimini. His amazing work has been lost to history. Today, Joan Zink will tell us what it's all about and the connecting threads of UFOs psychic experience, and the Atlantean two-eye power crystal. Here we go. Zinc in the hot zone. Atlantis, Bimini, and the UFO stones.
Joan, it's great to have you with us. Uh, of course, you were more than David Zink's wife. You helped him with the expeditions and even psychically guided his search near Bimini for the ruins of Atlantis. Let's start here with David and how his search for ancient ruins led him to Bimini. All right. Well, David was a very brilliant man. He was a PhD, and he uh, wrote to Charles Berlitz and corrected something in one of Berlitz's books. Well, Berlitz wrote back and told him about Manson Valentine, who was the Yale ethnologist down in Miami who had seen these huge stones. So David got in touch with Manson Valentine. We took our boat from Davison, sailed across to Mobile, and then went down the inland waterway. So we made it down to St. Petersburg, and then we went across down to Fort Myers and crossed Lake Okeechobee down to Miami to meet Manson Valentine. And that is J. Manson Valentine, who was the one who found the Bimini Wall in shallow water off the coast of Bimini in the same year that Edgar Cayce predicted it would be found. Yeah, and he took us out to the stones. We took our boat and um, left it at Bronze Marina, and we got a little boss and whaler to go out over the stones. Now, these are in very clear water, just about 16 feet off of North Bimini. This was the first expedition, 1974, and we took photographs. And we went back, and David wrote a book, a chapter for Mark Neiman's book on Atlantis. And then we planned the, the uh, 1975 expedition. And we were told to stay out of the water and out of the air during the summer solstice. And our four of the crew decided to go out anyway in the little boat uh, and over the stones site, and our compass spun around. Wow. Well, they came, they came back, and they were so excited uh, because that was very unusual. Now, Joan, as you know, the psychic Edgar Cayce spoke of the two-eye stone, T-U-A-O-I, that the Atlanteans use for crystal power stations. Now, what do you think the connection is with this hot zone area and the strange things that happen in the Bermuda Triangle with this two-eye crystal? The giant ruby crystal? Yes. Most of the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle are during the summer solstice and the, and the winter equinox. And my theory is that when the, the sun is directly overhead, that crystal is sometimes somehow amplified, and it creates such a, a vibration that it, I believe it does something to the magnetic field. And I believe at that time that that's why these, these guys have disappeared, even the boats and the ships and everything, uh, the planes, because they've gone into another dimension. Now I want to get I want to get back to the Time magazine article in 1973, just minutes before the Hawaii earthquake. The Omega system could not get anything back from the stratosphere where they sent the signals. The article theorized that the magnetic field had opened, and that was what caused the, the earthquake. So this is all connected with these weaknesses in the magnetic field. Fascinating. So uh, that's what happened during the summer solstice. When you say that they go into another dimension when they disappear, and it has something to do with this ruby crystal, um, do you think that the people who disappear, do you think they survive in that other dimension? Oh, yeah. And, you know, you knew about the Montauk experiments that the Navy did where they subjected the whole ship to Tesla's energy. Do you remember that? Yes, in the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, the ship disappeared. Right. And we, we, met, we met one of the men that had been on it when we were out in Colorado. And uh, he said when, when, that was, when that ship was released and they fell back into matter, people were caught in the, in the structure 
of the of the ship. That's unbelievable. Just an incredible account. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about on the expeditions you were on with David is the persistent legend that there was a fountain of youth on Bimini. You both found something extraordinary there, uh, but what was the background on this? The Indians in Puerto Rico, 500, 850 miles south, told Ponce de Leon about the healing fountain. And that's why he came, that's why he discovered Florida. They said it was a fountain that made old men young. So we were taken, we were taken in a small boat by Bonefish Charlie east of Bimini to a, a little island that had a mangrove swamp in it. And we hacked our way through that thing and got in that pool. And I have never been so high in my life. I remember, I remember David's silver cross turned black and he had the water analyzed and it had enough lithium in it to maintain a schizophrenic for a month. Wow. We knew about this place because one of the guys that lived out there had, was crippled with arthritis and he loved to play tennis. And he got in that thing three times and he never had any more arthritis. So this was the this was the fountain of youth that Ponce de Leon was trying to find when he found Florida. Incredible. And uh, how did you feel when you were in it? So oh, when I was I got out, the water was black. It was a spring. And when I got out, I I felt like I was the highest I had ever been in the meditation. It was incredible. Wow. Is it? And this was on Bimini? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm 92, and I look about 65 right now, and I don't know whether it was that or whether <laughs> it's the fact that I have a scalar antenna under my bed that my husband Larry built. That is interesting stuff. We won't get into scalar energy. <laughs> That's a- oh, yes. Well, this is fascinating uh, to me because when you were there, uh, being in Bimini, do you think that you could find that fountain again if you went to Bimini now? Well, I think they know. They know where it is because it's it's in a, a little island. Bonefish Charlie knew, and I'm sure other people know. Okay. Well, one of the most important and overlooked experts on Atlantis was Egerton Sykes, who was a retired British intelligence officer who spoke of extensive ruins there in the hot zone, including a temple of Isis underwater in the Bahamas. Now, what role did he play in your research with David? We met him in England. We went to visit him. Uh, And he said that the island of Bimini had been a temple. And I got to thinking, because I found that radioactive string off to the east, and and then the other, the healing thing on the other side, and I remember Casey said the Southern Islands were the healing centers, remember? Yes, and that gets us to an interesting discovery here, which is that David found a radioactive spring by following one of your readings on Bimini. Can you tell me about that? Well, David had an underwater Geiger counter, and uh, I knew he wanted to, to find it. And I was given the exact distance down the beach, and then the exact uh, yards to go out. I don't think it's over 20 yards out in the ocean. And he went out there, and there it was. They got an, a reading off of it. That's the kind of information I have gotten in my life because they claim I'm a clear channel. And uh, I've always been that way, I guess, partly my Scottish ancestry. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a section of David's classic book, The Stones of Atlantis, where he deals with the idea of Pleiadian beings visiting us here during the time of Atlantis. Here's a quote. In about 30,000 BC, a multi-plane emigration took place from the Pleiades to this planet. These emigrants did not require the hardware suggested by Eric von Daniken. Indeed, they did not descend completely into physical form for perhaps thousands of years. Surely these beings' actual appearance on Earth would have convinced the resident population that gods were visiting. Closer to energy than matter, they probably manifested themselves somewhat in the manner of individuals being beamed down, 
and they may possibly have been the shining ones of esoteric tradition. Can you shed some light on David's thoughts about the Pleiades and how the psychic readings that you and others were contributing to that? Well, I didn't do this. You know, we had an official psychic, and she's the one that got all that. I didn't want to be known as a psychic because I really had a fear of it. And uh, famous psychics have been done in in the past. I don't know if you know any of that. Yes, I'm sure it can be a dangerous profession. I wouldn't let him use my name. He used the, another name, Anne. I see. So, Carol, Carol, our official psychic, got all this stuff about the Pleiades. And, you know, David then sort of researching, and he found that many, many ancient cultures, calendars, started with the rising of the Pleiades. Right, that's interesting. What I got, that it was the center of universal love. That is fascinating. Now, I know during another expedition that David found a column that admitted light off of Bimini. Absolutely incredible. And what happened with it? Yes, that's what, that's what I, I didn't do a reading on it, but we went out to try to find it. And you know that that was Dr. Bell's column. He was a chiropractic man from uh, North Carolina, and he filmed that. I didn't know about that. You remember in the books, the picture of the rays coming out of that column? Yes. That must have been energized by that by the uh, ruby in some way. Absolutely. Now, one of the interesting things that David did, in addition to relying on psychic archaeology, was organizing hypnosis sessions about Atlantis. Now, what was that like? We heard a girl hypnotized to an Atlantean lifetime. This was the school psychologist that hypnotized her. And her husband was a language expert. She spoke a language under hypnosis that he had never heard. And here are the things I remember about her story. Her story. She said that the, the way they powered their, their places they lived, they had a receptor at the corner, at each corner of the house, and that received the energy, I guess, from the crystal. The other thing she said that I'll, I'll never forget, she said she had to make dinner. And the hypnotist said, well, what are you going to make? And she said, I'm going to make biscuits. And he said, how are you going to make them? And she said, I'm going to think them. Interesting. So she could manifest it just by thinking about it. Well, they were that advanced. They were extremely, extremely advanced. They had... They had underwater ships. You know, what, what they, they got into trouble, they knew how to control the, the human brain, tampering with DNA and RNA. And this is one thing that I've been worried about in our culture. If Casey said too much of an affront for their creative forces. They couldn't allow that to happen, that they would start creating things and they did. They had zombies. They, they had a healing temple, and they did something to the brains that made these people like slaves. And this is where the zombie theory, all, this all came out of mythology. That is so interesting. I know that Casey described what he called the things, you know, the untouchables, that the Atlanteans held as slaves, a kind of cyborg hybrid human and zombies, and sometimes half-animal, half-human. These automatons sound like what you're describing here. Under hypnosis, they asked her what her husband did, and he, she said, oh, he works in the healing temple. And, the, and they said, the hypnotist said, well, what does he do there? And she said, oh, I'm not allowed to talk about it. But he insisted, and finally she said, well, he works on the animal people. There were people that had, well, you know, the centaurs. Yes. They were actually, they were actually real. Now, Joan, how much of a role did the UFO aspect play into this research? David felt, and probably many other people feel, that there's been a UFO influence on the Earth. When we went to Peru, went up to Cusco, and the guy took us to Olaytambo. Here's the story. There were five 
50 ton blocks that had been brought down from a mountain across a stream and halfway up another mountain and they were in a row and they were so tightly put together you couldn't put a knife between them. So a little Spanish boy said, Senora, come here. And he took me up there and he said, feel under here, under those stones that was glazed. Like some kind of nuclear thing had gone on there because those stones had been melted under there. So they'd been subjected to intense heat. Well, no human being could, could have done that with 50 ton blocks. Absolutely. Um, well, this is something about how they built the pyramids also. They're so large and so well designed that it's beyond human comprehension. And that's right. What is your experience with UFOs? Well, my girlfriend and I, I remember a time when one was came right down to us and, and, and we were in separate rooms I was visiting her in California that was kind of spooky but I told you that when I was, and I had acupuncture by Dr. Ma who was a famous acupuncturist from Hong Kong after that treatment I went out of my body just slipped out and I was in a UFO and I saw the curved dashboard and there was a being there that frightened me. He turned to an astronaut. Uh, that was just an instant, you know. Now, what did it look like that it frightened you? Can you describe it? All, all I saw was the, uh, the curved dashboard. That's all. That's where I went. Right. But did you, the being itself, what did the being look like? He was in some kind of outfit. I couldn't tell what he was. I couldn't see a face or anything. That's very interesting. And I think David, as a scientist, is a very enlightened guy because he's using his UFO knowledge along with his ancient history knowledge. So that's pretty rare. Well, David was told that he was one of the oldest souls on the planet. And by the way, he had no freight line in his hand. Huh. Or psychic could not, she could not believe that. She said, how did you do this? Well, he, he was told that he had come in with a group years and centuries ago, and they tried to set up a civilization on the moon, but they couldn't make it work. Wow, that's so interesting. I had a dream, Daniel, that I was in a huge thing like a honeycomb. It was huge, and there were individual births all along the walls of that thing. And I was flying through it, and I saw Dave Zink in one of those. And I remember thinking, what on earth is Dave Zink doing a, a thing like this? <laughs> and then, then I saw that movie, uh, Fire in the Sky. I believe yes. that was the one where the, and they showed a thing like that. Yes. Where this guy, where this guy had been. <sighs> Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what did you think of David when you first met him? How did he get into Edgar Casey's work? Somehow I was told about Edgar Casey, And I remember wondering at the time, uh, do I want to believe this or not? And I decided to accept it. And I even wrote a little article about it that was published about Casey. You know, he was very spiritual. He had read the Bible through many times, and he had that being that appeared to him, that angel in the woods. Yes. And uh, he was very evolved, and I, I knew that I would believe in Casey regardless of what, you know, all the fundamentalists say. Right, exactly. Now, one thing I found of interest is that David called his expeditions the Poseidon. Poseidia, yeah. Poseidia, which is the name of one of the Atlantean islands, right? Yeah. Um, you know, these myths of the gods and goddesses, uh, they were all the kings and queens on Atlantis. Yes, definitely. Um, you mentioned Egerton Sykes, and Sykes believed that Bimini was called, was Murius in the Celtic legends. You know, when we found, when I found that radioactive spring, he says, now you're onto something. Oh. He said, now you're onto something. 
And it was the fact that this was a healing a healing temple. I guess they still use radioactive water and healing. I don't know. Uh, that's very interesting. There certainly are experiments with that. And can you tell me about the Bimini Road and the impressions that you got looking at that? It was so well uh, organized. Well, we had we had the blocks tested, and there was a difference in the blocks that are right next to each other. So it couldn't have been beach rock like they tried, tried to say down in Miami. Yes, there's no question the Bimini Wall is a man-made monolithic structure, and that only leaves who made it, since we know the only people identified there were by Casey saying that it was a major outpost of Atlantis. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is, during this time when you were looking for Atlantis, were you in touch with the Casey Foundation, and did they support the work uh, that David was doing at all? Well, they, they knew they gave us $2,000 for the trip. We had enough freeze-dried food to feed people for 70 days. By the way, you can't imagine the stuff I went through there. Well, there's the one story you mentioned to me that's very disturbing, and that was after you got a, a boat from Peter Tompkins, who was the famous Mexican pyramids explorer. Uh, do you want to tell that story now? Yeah. He gave us a flat, and he got this other boat, and this skipper of that boat picked a guy who was a Satanist Whoa. for his running mate. So my son was 12 years old. That other skipper made a pass at my son, and he told his dad. Then Dave tried to get that guy to leave. Wow. He wanted that guy out of the expedition. Well, I still remember this. This Satanist was in the cockpit, and Dave was down below uh, in his scuba, way down, 16 feet. And this guy got a spear gun, and he started to go overboard. And I knew what he was going to do, because he, he didn't want to have to leave that expedition. And he was very mad. And I just said, no, Richard, no. And that stopped it. Wow. Give you an idea of the stuff we went through. Whatever happened to that Satanist? I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Unbelievable. He probably joined some satanic expedition. It was, it was an adventure of a lifetime. I can only imagine. Now, one of the interesting things that David found on Bimini were these ancient mounds. Uh, some of them had sophisticated shapes, like the shapes of cats, uh, and could only be viewed from the air. What did you think of these mounds? You know, Sykes believed that Bimini was a, heli was a temple. So it's not surprising that these mounds were nearby. And I just read that he found, Raymond Lee found the divine ratio in the mounds, the same that the pyramid in Giza, uh, Teotihuacan, and a, and a Jewish temple or Hebrew temple, all had this sacred ratio. That is very interesting, and we know from Graham Hancock's work, uh, the sacred geometry is a kind of signature of this advanced lost civilization while fleeing destruction by the misuse of the two-eye crystal by a group he refers to as the Sons of Belial. He said the records were kept in three places, in Egypt, beneath the Sphinx, in Yucatan, and in a temple of Poseidia, which is in shallow water near Bimini. Now, what do you think of the reality that the Hall of Records exists, and have you ever come across anything like it in your travels with David? Well, I think they probably are there. You know, um, some guy found me, and uh, Casey said they were also in the Yucatan, and he wanted me to go down to Colombia. And uh, it was Colombia was very dangerous, and I really didn't want to go. And I gave him a reading. And he found this this big pyramid, but he didn't really try to find the the records. I remember there were armed people, and it wasn't it wasn't very safe. Oh and uh, that that was just while I was living over at New Smyrna Beach. That wasn't just about fifteen years ago. I did what I could. I didn't want to go down there. I, I'll tell you, the expedition was wonderful, but it was very, very wearing. Sure. 
Sure. Maybe Atlantis can show us that you can't use the energy in the wrong way. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And we got to learn to use the energy right, or we're just we're going to be uh, exited off this planet. And it, it's pretty grim. Uh, I don't want to think that it's going to end that way, but you know the Fatima prophecy that that you know the Pope saying it when he read it. Yes, yes. And I read a psychic account. I read a psychic account. Years ago, by someone named Ray Stanford, I think that was his name, and and it was in there that if mankind doesn't turn to love, that wars and cataclysm will take a half to two thirds of the population off this planet, and those who survive will be changed genetically to the eye. And that will mean make the God consciousness possible. See if we could all if we could all see auras, we would know the crooks, the liars, uh, the right. good people. <laughs> and and David could see auras. Did I tell you? No, that's interesting. Yes, I I'll tell you how that happened. He was in a class. He, he, it was a class of his, and they could see his aura. These kids. This was wow. down at university. This was down somewhere in Texas. I can't remember. And so he started being able to see theirs, and he could tell when they were excited and happy. He could see the flare, and that's what happened. I was able to see them, but um, wow! I just I don't see I don't see the whole egg. David could see the whole egg around mm. the body that has all the the past lives. In the West, we think purity is following a bunch of rules, but in the East, it's a vibration in the aura. See, I'm old now, and I've learned a lot of stuff, Daniel. <laughs> yes, it sounds like you've learned incredible things. One of the things that you mentioned to me was that the natives in Bimini were very familiar with UFOs, and they called them fireflies. Yes, they saw them coming in and out of the water. What my theory is, they, uh, Daniel, that they are trying to keep the magnetic field strong, maybe. Maybe that's what they're doing, because there's so many there. Um, where do you think they're from? Who knows? I have no idea. Uh, did you ever read Zachariah Sitchin? Yes. Oh, yes. I don't know if these are the Anunnaki's or, or, yep. or they were the ones that came in first for this planet, I think. And yes. they, they're probably going to come back. Well, you know, um, I've, probably blown your, I've probably blown your mind with all this, except <laughs> you're already... You're already pretty advanced into all this stuff. <laughs> I love it all. Can you tell me how David felt about his work looking back at the end of his life? At the end of his life, he was living over with my daughter in Ocala, and he told me, if I had to leave now, I would be so grateful for what I got to do. So he felt with his work, he had accomplished his mission. He loved it. He loved getting to do that. And he was a very old soul and no fault line. So he was, he came in to do this work. He knew me from another life. It's just an amazing connection that the two of you had in this Atlantis work. Um, one of the fascinating things about David is that he put together the psychic circle to do the archaeology. The two other psychics that he used in addition to you was a woman named Karen and a woman named Carol. Carol has passed away. And I'll tell you the story she told me. They were she was crossing the desert with her little girl, and a UFO took her child. And when she came back, the child had cancer of the nervous system. Unbelievable. And uh, that's all I know. And Carol passed away, I don't, I don't know how many years ago, but uh, that's all I remember about Carol. How fascinating. I hope the child got better. I hope so, too. What about the other psychic, Karen? Because she could 
been a laser beam with her mind uh, oh. every Thursday, and it would stay bent for 45 minutes, something like that. I don't remember the details. And she's the one he took down to, uh, that must have been her name, down to Titicaca. She took me out of my body one night, and, you know, uh, but do you know about the Merkaba? Yes, that's fascinating work. Well, I experienced it. Uh, you're asleep and something lifts you up and circles you up. And um, it's supposed to be a sign you've reached universal love or, you, or uh, unconditional love. That's it. You've reached unconditional love. That is fascinating. It sounds like a remarkable journey for you looking back over all this. It has been. It's been amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I used to think about, I used to think about Atlantis when I looked out there at the, at the ocean. Well, the work that you and David have done on Atlantis, working right in the hot zone there in Bimini and the Bahamas to uncover these amazing truths about our ancient past has been such an inspiration to me and many others, uh, really putting the Casey readings to the test and revealing so much about this incredibly advanced culture. It's really meant a lot to all of us. Well, thank you so much. And no, no, I'm thanking you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. You take care. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.